Let me go. I can get my cooler. Hey, I got 10 to 12 beers in there. They're yours. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Underrated Podcast. We're a podcast that discusses films that are underrated, underappreciated, the ones that have slipped under the radar and passed most people by. As always, I am one of your hosts, Ariel Ortiz, and today I am joined by Derek McDuff and Alan Torres. As always. Hello. Um, And today we're going to be talking about um, a choice of my own, and it's a movie that I've been kind of been wanting to watch for a while. I've heard really good things about it, but it's always one that's not really discussed much and is a little bit more um, underground indie, in my opinion, or consider that at least. Um, And we are going to be talking about Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, which is um, about two lovable hillbillies that come across a case of assumptions where more so the ass is made out of the you instead of the me. So we could just start digging in and discussing this really funny movie. Yeah, uh, this is a movie that I had actually kind of in the, had in the back of my mind as thinking about covering for a while now. And the main reason is because this is one of my brother's, like one of his favorite movies of all time. He's always been kind of like, you should cover this on your show at some point. Um, because he was introduced to it by a friend who basically is Dale from this movie. Like, he's he's a good old boy, but he's like the nicest guy you will ever meet. And just by looking at him, you might be like, oh, what's this guy's deal? But he was he's an absolute sweetheart. And so I watched this movie with him and my brother and a bunch of my brother's friends a couple years back. And... I was just really won over by it. I think it's it's very fun and heartwarming. It does a really uh, good job of taking all of these tropes and conventions that you would see in all these Cabin in the Woods, Friday the 13th, uh, even like uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I'm like, oh, there's those, you know, watch, watch out for them, them and them hills, them hill people. And it just kind of flips all of that on its head and makes it really a commentary on just kind of judging people and the lack of communications and the problems that causes in the world. Uh, So I think it does manage to convey that really important message in a very fun and stupid and goofy way that I had an absolute ball with. Like, it's this movie so ridiculous. Like, when he just, like, jumped, the guy jumps head first into the wood chipper, I was, like, (laughs) dying and laughing there's so many moments like it's just like these kids are out here killing them by the way alan tudyk is always a win for me i'm always in the pocket for him so like hell yeah he's amazing mm -hmm, as soon as i saw him pop up i was like okay cool i'm i'm on board uh even though he's the first name character he's more of the supporting role but he he's so so good in this um and i do like that he is a little more even though i just said he was like the more supporting character he is more of a central role than you would usually see him in. He's usually just doing, like, voice work or showing up as, like, Wendy's mom in the new Peter Pan, or Wendy's dad in the new Peter Pan movie or whatever. So it's really cool to see him flex those muscles. But one thing that really bugs me in a lot of movies, especially horror films, is just the kind of, like, oh my gosh, if these people would just talk to each other or just do the smart thing, then this would, everything would be solved. And this movie takes that up to the, like, 11th degree like the turning it up to 11 but it is actually a commentary on how we need to be more communicative communicative i can't even communicate this word uh in our day-to-day life and so i think that was a really smart fun meta way to handle this just kind of brisk fun movie mm-hmm. yeah i i actually saw this a long time ago i i remember i had a friend who oh gosh when did this movie come out it was 2010 2010 okay yeah for sure i saw it a long time ago because uh this was like early netflix like this is when netflix was finally streaming and people were kind of mm-hmm. getting into it in the early 2010s and I had a buddy who was like oh my god you're, you're a horror guy you're gonna love this movie and he kept pushing it and pushing it and pushing it you know we would go out drinking all the time but he's like bro you have to watch this and i was like all right fine so i finally sat down and watched it and i fucking loved it it was it's one of the funniest movies i've ever seen I had seen Alan Tudyk in Firefly, and R.I.P. He, he was Wash. pretty cool. Let's do yeah. R.I.P. Wash. Wash. And he's also Steve the Pirate. Mm-hmm. 
and I saw the guy who plays Dale, uh, mm-hmm. Tyler Labine. He does uh, like. I was like gonna he, say yeah, he's yeah, he, he's great in this, but in Reaper he's fucking mm-hmm. outstanding. Mm-hmm. So I was really, I was like, all right, cool. At least I know these two guys are really great actors and just stole the. Sh- I mean, it's their show, so they just <laughs> completely killed it. And yeah, Derek, just like you said, it's a great commentary. I feel like it's in that realm of horror film that satirizes the horror genre, mm-hmm. like Scream or Cabin in the Woods. And I absolutely love that. I, I love when it kind of pokes fun at itself. And, and what's also great, too, is that it has some great gore. It really goes out of its way. Like, it, it really pushes it when it wants to. But it's also hilarious as well. Because I feel like one of the biggest things with horror comedy is that sometimes it just it just doesn't hit. It either hits on the horror or it hits on the comedy. And then it just does a really bad job being both. And just like, you know, Cabin in the Woods and Scream, the, this movie hit, hits the nail on the head on both ends. It does a great job. All the actors are awesome. Enjoyable story. And like you said, like, the commentary is great. You know, it's those things where it's just like, don't go, don't go into the house. And, and I just love how it's this funny, the kids are killing themselves. Like, that, that line, he's just like, you know, Alan Tudy's character is calling the cops. And he's just like, oh my god, I don't know what the fuck's going on. These kids are just killing, they're running out of nowhere, they're killing themselves. It's like a cult, and I just absolutely had me fucking dying. Um, I didn't get the opportunity to rewatch it, just because uh, life happens. But I remember it very fondly, and it's just such a banger. And and honestly, I actually had this in the back of my mind. I was thinking about doing an underrated, but the thing is, I'm always on uh, the horror, uh, our horror, uh, dread it on Reddit. <laughs> And it gets brought up a lot. So I was kind of like, ah, oh, is it underrated? I don't know. Is it one of those like. It's an under radar. I feel like under the, radar, the, yeah. horror, the horror fans, it's maybe maybe not underrated, but like, I don't think like a lot of general audiences see yeah. it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, when Ariel had brought it up, I was like, all right, cool. Yeah. I think it's kind of under the radar. Yeah. I hang out. I hang out there way too much. So. When I think a movie's underrated and they start talking about it all the time and go, oh, shit, well, I guess it's not. And then someone goes, have you heard of this? And I'm like, yeah, of course. What the fuck? And they're like, yeah, like you said, it's the general audience. They're all not going to hear about it. And I, and again, this was kind of a cult film. Yeah, when it came out, I think a lot of people had seen it and then it just disappeared. So and then I can't even believe it. It came out 2010. I feel like it, it was years ago. But damn, yeah. That's mm-hmm. nuts, but total total blast. I, I it's a great. It, I, I honestly kind of wish it was more of a classic mm-hmm. that more people knew about because it's so damn funny and like yeah. it, it's not particularly scary, but it's gory. But it's it's just so much fun, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I just had a, such a wonderful time with this movie. I think it it's definitely going to become like one that I rewatch very regularly, just for it. it it's just such. While it's zany and like crazy, it is very much based in and very grounded in reality because of this. This is kind of like how people, <laughs> this kind of situation would cut if you make that assumption of a hillbilly of pulling the scene at the beginning, kind of a little reminiscent of Deliverance itself, which is like mm. considered as one of the prime and earliest versions of like that 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 notion of hillbillies being like scary or etch or you know sketchy with the kid at the like i I don't know if he was like pumping water i think it was pumping water but that kid right away i was like deliverance right there that that's like a reference just missing the banjo and the the rocking chair for that one but yeah like it's such a incredible movie i i know it might i i alan tudyk is just kind of like a guy that that it is very much it involves himself in cult. He just finds a cult following in his own way. Like he's for us and uh, going to cons and stuff like that. He's just a regular to us. So he's just always funny, always entertaining in everything that he gets a sense in. Like definitely if you want to check out a lot more of on camera things, especially now is, is resident evil. It resident alien is such an incredible, like showing of his physicality in both in, normal face and then in prosthetics as well and yeah it, it's he's he's just alan tudyk like he's just as alan tudyk and and that's all you can say like everything he's in just 
is another, another quick shout out for him is if anybody's seen Santa Clarita died, he actually takes over the role of a severed zombie head from another Firefly at the Lum. He takes over the Nathan yeah. Fillion role. So you're mm-hmm. like, oh, but yeah. mm-hmm. and he fucking God, dude. Oh my god, I'm tracking off a little bit, but fucking Santa Clarita Diet was so fucking good, and right? I am so sad it got canceled. It was easily one of the best Netflix originals. Mm-hmm. I, I, me and my girlfriend yes. were obsessed with it, and and yeah, when when I heard Nathan Fillion left, I was really sad, and they're like, but Alan Tudyk, and I was like, oh, even better. Yep, yep. I, was like, <laughs> I was like, that's fine with me. And but, then, yeah, uh, I mean, I, yeah. Oh, sorry, I want to give a little oh, no, shout out to yeah. him too, as the resident DC guy. I love that he's done so he's many the Joker. DC performances. He's and the Harley Joker. Quinn. He's Clayface and Harley Quinn. He's mm-hmm. played Superman in, uh, I think maybe Flashpoint, uh, a couple of those. And it's so wild how he has three unique performances in, in mm-hmm. those. Like he's able to play Superman. I think it's also, um, dark side war or not dark side war. Um, that one and Joker and Clayface where I'm just like, each one is so unique. Sometimes you can kind of hear that graveliness in his voice, mm-hmm. but it's so impressive that he can go from these characters with such ease. And then, oh, he was also in um, Doom Patrol as uh, Mr. Nobody, and he knocked it out of the park in that. And and one of my favorite little things in Doom Patrol was it's very weird and meta and strange. And one of my favorite gags is that he doesn't return in the second season. And... They're kind of, and this is when Doom Patrol and Harley Quinn were all in the DC Universe app. Mm-hmm. So it, it might not make sense anymore if you've watched it now. But essentially, they go, Hey, where's Mr. Nobody? Like, why the fuck isn't he here? Kind of thing. And they make this subtle joke of, like, Oh, well, maybe he had better things to do. And at the bottom of the screen, they show this little advert for the Harley Quinn show yeah. as soon as that <laughs> happens. And at first, you go, What the fuck? Do they do that on purpose? Like, is that like an ad but in reality it was like the perfect like meta yeah. joke yeah he went over but yeah, yeah. sorry i had a, i had to jerk him off in the dc stuff real fast <laughs> but yeah oh no no i think but I, I love that that like in in the sense that that the industry really does like and they know him like he's mm-hmm. become not- notable as being a, such a versatile voice specifically but uh, but character actor as well and i'm, I'm really happy for alan tudyk Mm-hmm. Anytime but, Disney's like, we need a weirdo. Who can we get? Get him on the phone. Doesn't he play? It, he uh, he uh, plays a, a chicken. chicken. He yeah. plays yeah. a chicken, yeah, and he's hey. like, I went to Juilliard, and then he like he was also like he's like basically what John Ratzenberger is for Pixar movies. He's in like the main. He's in like every Disney animated movie going back the last I don't know how many years. Like he's in Fro- uh, the Frozen. He's like the Duke of Weselton or whatever the Weselton. Um. So yeah, he he you can and always. And he's also kinda... Duke Wes- Weaselton. In, in Zootopia as a as a pun yeah. of so that, he, he that just, performance. He, exactly, yeah, yeah. So he just shows up in all these great like little cameos slash supporting just really bizarre great character roles. Mm-hmm. But um just kinda of before before Lee um speaking about Dale um's actor, but uh, but the part that just it's it's just Alan Tude experience. That's the part one of the most funniest parts to me was the scene where he's giving Dale the nail gun and the nail gun goes off and he just is like whoa <laughs> it just hit me so hard and it was so funny um but yeah going to to dale's actor like i've known him yeah since since reaper but uh, m- more recently like he's a really good dramatic actor and has had like a 10 years since the beginning and it's going to be actually ending this season i think or next season of um new amsterdam he's plays a really awesome character in that one as well and uh, um tyler labine is, is who yeah. we're talking about yeah 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 tyler labine yeah he's just he's awesome too and awesome in this role just off the bat you like love him to death to death he he's he's such a fun character and yeah, and all these just going on to the the teenagers themselves, and like of course the Chad is a literal Chad, you know, kind of thing. He is the Chad. He has, you know, the pop collar, polo shirt. He's wearing a white belt that that the belt um, loop buckle is pushed to the side. It's not centered. It, it's just he's the embodiment of of the Chad. And him going crazy, and it, it was—it's such an incredible twist, you know. Like it's—it is a classic horror twist of like 
the reveal of his hip of his parentage and stuff, but and which is kind of sad in its way. And it's very tragic, and you and like the I love how like Dale feels sorry for him for a second, but he's like, but this man's crazy, <laughs> kind of thing. And like, oh, this explains it as well as that that he's crazy. And and yeah, that was like a pretty awesome because like he he, he turns it's literally a transformation of of him being like the the teenage you know hero like um who's the one from from Friday the Thirteenth Tommy um yeah the, the, yeah is that he, Kevin Bacon no no he he Kevin dies, Bacon in dies. The, the original yeah yeah, yeah that's all the first oh you're talking about the later dies. oh the um uh, the yeah, later, later one it's uh with um Corey Corey Feldman. There it's not go, Corey yeah. Feldman, though. But, yeah, yeah. He's in he's in couple. He, he, they can't no, no, his no, actors. but he's in yeah, a Tommy. They, they change actors. Yeah, they change yeah, actors. I think the first Tommy is like when he's a kid, he mm. fucking shaves his head. And then later on it's like another guy, and then I think it's another guy after. I don't remember. Yeah. I, but yeah. But but yeah, like uh he you know, he goes from the, that kind of character to just slowly descending into madness and then to the and then to have that reveal of like which is kind of like a classic killer origin story of like, oh, like my my father was a serial killer and it's in my genes and stuff like that and go crazy. Just a really awesome concept and 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 I and that's what you get for for these like indie movies. You could definitely see it wasn't high budget, but it made it even more darling for that. It it, it felt very much like, um, especially like the opening scene, and um, re- such recently watching um, Evil Dead for the first time. That opening scene felt very much like Evil Dead in quality and of it as well. And and yeah, it, it's such a. I, I, it's such an enjoyable movie. It, I I loved it from like beginning to end, and I was very very happy that 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 the misidentification of of Tucker and Dale did not last. <laughs> I was very much expecting it to turn out like oh yeah they're gonna like get get arrested because nobody will believe them, and, and then yeah like how Allison's friend was like oh she has Stockholm syndrome. So it was very nice. It was very nice to have them actually be believed and to actually the the um news people which like that was pretty fun like with at the beginning with a very scary movie trope of like the bad guy is still alive kind of thing but yeah i was very happy that that they didn't get arrested and then it, they got their happy endings well tucker kind of like uh lost his vacation home <laughs> and his car yeah. but but in other ways like uh I, I did love that, like, Dale kind of gained the confidence, and yeah, it was a very, very fun movie. Loved it. Yeah, yeah. I de- And, you know, I, I touching on what you were saying, Ariel, I really like the arc that Dale goes on through the movie, where at the beginning, he is just kind of this very timid guy, and he, he's, he doesn't, he's not confident in his looks, and, you know, he's afraid to talk to one, but he's such a good guy, even in the beginning, you know, when they see that scene of Allison just getting ready to skinny dip and he just like he immediately closes his eyes you know he's such a like a wholesome dude and but he just he has he won't stick up for himself and there's even that great scene where he's just like stick up for yourself and he's like all right I'm gonna take the beer and he's just like well and he just was like not not my beer right now and seeing his arc throughout the film till the end when he's finally ready to go out with this girl that he's clearly built up these feelings for I thought it was just like a really tender nice emotional journey for this character and you know it was it was good because it was never anything about like being like there's no toxicity in his just coming to terms with that where you as you have you know the character who is the chad who is very toxic uh he never goes down that path where he just like assumes because he's like the quote-unquote the typical hero of the story that he's gonna get the girl and he's gonna hook up with her at the start like you see in so many horror movies like the couple hooks up and then they get killed by the murderers and it just subverts all of that in a way that i really enjoyed i agree i I like that too you know i i I mean it kind of shows how like i mean i'm not trying to be oh i'm a nice guy but like sometimes the chat is just a piece of shit Mm -hmm. and the chat is a chat yeah you know they don't deserve to kind of get the girl and I was kind of like, yeah, fuck you. That's what you get, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. But um, anybody who's worn a pop pop collar, you're a Chad. <laughs> yeah. And uh, 
yeah, I mean, it's just a fun film, man. It, it's great. And I um, want to give a big shout out to my buddy, Dane, who I miss very much. Big shout out to him for introducing this movie to me. And I'm glad that we came back around to talk about it. Because, uh, yeah, I remember him bugging me so much about it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to see it. And, and I really hope more people get out there and watch it. Because it's really hard to come by a good horror comedy. Especially mm-hmm. like this. where it's And it's a great happy ending, too. I, I usually prefer the absolutely horrific and sad endings. You know, just horrible shit happen to people but this one yeah the whole time you're rooting for them and i was like i really want them to get their happy ending and they did and i know um one of you guys said like oh he lost his vacation home but i'm like but he survived i think he got got his fingers back (laughs) yeah well he got fingers back back. (laughs) (laughs) so at least at the end he got that and he survived i think at the end of the day when you go through something traumatic like that you're like i'm glad i'm alive so yeah I, and and yeah, I I do love like we've talked about a lot of films that fall into this category of really meta horror films that are subverting the genre, and I definitely have a fondness for them. You know, we talked about the Evil Dead remake. Uh, obviously, we talked about the Cabin in the Woods, one of my all time favorite movies. And then with Matt and Mark, we call we talked about um oh what was the it's the I'm spacing on the name um it's <sighs> Bubba Hotep. No, 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 the the one we did with him before that it was um about the 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 fight where it makes the final girl like an actual action badass. Um, oh, the home invasion ready? one. You're next. You're, You're next. next. Thank you, thank you. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you. But, I yeah. wish I was on that one because I absolutely love that film. That, that yeah. movie's really fucking that good was, too. But yeah, and then yeah, like you said, I also got a shout out my brother Mitchell for for making me watch this movie. And strangely, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but when I went on like just watch. This movie is like streaming everywhere, everywhere at mm-hmm. least that has ads. So there's something weird going on with the rights to it or something where because I like was like, OK, where should I watch this? I'm like, oh, it's on Peacock and Amazon and Tubi and like Hoopla and like just anywhere. It's like so hopefully with all of those options, with all these free options to watch it, people will start discovering this movie because like we said, you know, there there are so many ways now for people to watch movies with stuff like Tubi and stuff introducing these kind of like weirder horror things. But yeah, it's just on all of these apps. So I don't know what mm-hmm. happened with the rights there, but I'm glad it's mi- oh, potentially going to be in a lot of uh, front of a lot of eyeballs. Yeah, yeah, I really do hope that that more movies follow that kind of thing. Like just just stream on different platforms at, at the same time. Share yeah. share it among the people. You know. Absolutely, yeah, most definitely. And I wanted to ask, so since we're kind of talking about films that kind of subvert the genre, mm. what are some films that you guys personally really love, like that are closer, even if they're popular or underrated, whichever, which one like hits you where like you like that it turns the genre on its head kind of thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be horror. It could be anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in recent years, kind of going back to that, that you're next, and I had mentioned it in that episode, I'm pretty sure, but but in recent years, like, Ready or Not has been a really mm-hmm. awesome one, in my opinion. I really love that that one. Kind of, yeah, subverting the, the final girl kind of genre, in a way. Uh, kind of holiday <laughs> holiday one, I guess, in, in a way, is like a, like, Violent Night in recent... Mm-hmm. That, that one just popped into my head with, like, very much warrior Saxon historic santa claus just going die hard on everybody was a really fun like kind of subversion of genre also like it, i just watched it yesterday renfield is a little subversion of genre too like it's just to with that. the whole touching touching on classic movies they even have like a sequence that's very that's like in the style of and and ha- reenacts scenes from the universal dracula the black and white one but it's kind of like turns it on its head as well with this like concept of of renfield actually being in a toxic relationship and and taking it on that kind of road i enjoyed that that twist but yeah those are like some recent ones that have popped into my head so one that i feel like this movie has been probably reclaimed a lot recently when it first came out. Uh, I know a lot of people were just like, what is this? And I had no interest in it. I think that's probably because it was mismarketed. 
But I think that a film that does a really good job, and it's once again in the horror genre, of kind of taking the typical villain and, or typical um, typical victim and making them into the villain is Jennifer's body. I think that is such a clever screenplay uh, by Diablo Cody. It's like, that is exactly how she, you should mut- mutilize Megan Fox. She's so good at the dynamic between her and Amanda Seyfried is so good. Um, if anybody listening has not seen Jennifer's body, it is an absolute blast, especially if you're a horror fan. Check it out. It's, I think, honestly, I would have said maybe five years ago it's underrated, but it's kind of become this this darling um, where it's it's one. I think it if you it has the record for the biggest increase in letterbox rating over the past ten years um, because people are kind of reexamining it through new updated eyes and being like, did we miss the boat on this one? Um, so yeah, I, I really love Jennifer's Body. You know what? I, I I actually wanted to see that. Oh, now recently I wanted to watch it because when it came out, you're right, it was marketed. It, it was marketed as this very like sexy vampire sexy and it's hot yeah. oh my god mm-hmm. you know girls making out together and i was like i mean i guess and and it just and i know like i heard diablo cody wrote it and i was like well, you know juno and all that mm-hmm. i was like but it's just the way it was marketed it was so like ugh. or i was like uh eh, maybe i'll wait for it maybe whatever and then yeah like you said it, it kind of get this it, it got this um reevaluation where i was like damn all right maybe now i kind of want to give it a watch but yeah. um well to Ariel, yeah. I think one last thing I'll say to Ariel for the, to pique her interest in it is that Adam Brody is in it and he is incredible as this like almost like evil Brandon Flowers character. I freaking love like he's just like this early two thousands like glam rocker with like the mascara and stuff like that. And he is mm-hmm. so good. He's somebody who I'm a huge fan of. I know you're a big fan of too, Ariel. And he just he needs to be in more stuff and he's great in it in a supporting mm-hmm. role. Yeah, like I saw I've seen like a bit of it. Hasn't grabbed me yet, though. Well, watch the watch the whole thing. Watch the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Cause it it, I just I, I like it was a scene with with um with Megan Fox and you she's have the, she's tolerable, but she's yeah. so good. Like she's like this is the role she was like made for. Like she's mm-hmm. like whatever in the Transformers and like New Girl, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like this is exactly like this is tailor made what she should be playing. And yeah, once you have the context of the whole film, it's it's. It's brilliant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll check it out. It hasn't like I I don't yeah. It hasn't hit my radar or it's gonna take a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like Brody, you like everybody else, it. and that, I had the same I had the same feeling. And I eventually went back mm-hmm. in Austin and I was like, you know what? Same. I missed the boat on this mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Alan, Alan, what about what were you saying? What about you? Oh man, see like. I, I don't maybe it did we, we've covered it before shameless plug they came together I just I fucking uh-huh. hate romantic comedies I hate that passion. one <laughs> I know you hate it but we like it let us like things Ariel yeah. <laughs> I'm not even yeah. I can't I didn't even bash you on liking Jennifer's body I'm you just saying three seconds ago <laughs> I said I didn't. I'm giving perspective on my own. All right, thing. well, let Alan talk about why he likes the movie. Um, <sighs> no, I, well, I, I mean, I hate romantic comedies. I really don't like them. They fucking piss me off. And it, it just really gives, like... But anyway, I, I won't go into that. But what I loved about it was that it was just so... Ah, it was perfectly done for me. Like, I loved the fucking comedy. I just loved how bonkers and... And wacky it was, and it really just turned everything up inside its head. Like it just kept giving for me. Like it just kept mm-hmm. giving, giving, giving. Where like romantic comedies, I feel like just depress me, and I'm just like, oh god, like. Aww. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. They just they make me so sad for some reason. Like they piss me off. Yeah. But yeah. This one, I was just like, oh god, this is a fucking blast. Uh. And yeah, like it just it just turned everything around, and and like yeah, it it, it I think for me it was a. I guess it's kind of how like people. Well, this movie, if if anything, it's. I feel Tucker, Gale versus Evil is a great movie to show non horror fans mm-hmm. because, yeah. you know, they're gonna go in with expectations like, oh, the hillbillies are the bad guys, blah blah blah, and then no, you find out they're not, and it's hilarious and, and it does a great job. So I feel like Tucker and Dale versus Evil is like, uh, or actually, sorry, they came together mm-hmm. is a romantic comedy version of that kind of subversion yeah, for yeah. Devil's Evil. Mm-hmm. so i absolutely love that so for me 
Because I won't lie, I was so fucking nervous going into that movie. I was like, oh my god, it's romantic comedy. I fucking... But it has Paul Rudd, and then and my girlfriend was like, well, it has Amy Poehler. I was like, ah, fuck it, okay. And then we started watching it, and, and like, first five minutes, I was like, oh, this is that type of movie? I'm not, <laughs> and I fucking fell up. But anyways, go go back and listen to the episode. Yeah, I'll jerk it off more on that one. But yeah, <laughs> definitely that one. That that was one of the ones where I was like, yeah. Well, I have one more. I don't, I don't know if this would qualify or not, because it feels like it might be a kind of subversion of just like a dumb... It's not even stoner because they're you don't see them as stoners, but they're just they act like stoners of just like those kind of eighties movies with like two idiots in it. But then like actually, it's like a time travel adventure, and that's Bill and Ted. I freaking <laughs> love Bill and Ted, like all three of them, but especially that first one is such a classic. Mm-hmm. So crates, uh, <laughs> so yeah. crates. Oh my god, is that where that's from? Yeah, yeah. so crates. I've actually I've actually never seen. The Bill and Ted movies, nor Jennifer's oh. Body. Dude, you got okay. And, Bill and Ted first. That's that's like an iconic yeah. <laughs> movie. Yeah, that's that's one of them. I was like, uh, I, I've seen parts of it, but I didn't know what was going on because I guess it's mm-hmm. a lot more than I thought. So yeah, uh, I kind of I got to give it a shot. Strange yeah. things are afoot at the Circle K. Mm-hmm. Be awesome <laughs> to each other. Uh, another one. I don't think it was very like submersive, but I uh, like like it changed the genre. But I feel like it was more like a let's push it, mm-hmm. and and I think it just it, again it's it's a little horror movie that could a little mega slasher that could was Terrifier two, where I just it, it just blew my mind how such a small budget went balls to the wall extreme, and just did very well because I, I won't lie the first one. I I liked it, but I thought it was very like torture porny. And then Terrifier Two, I felt like they understood this time around that they had to do a blend of like black comedy, like mm-hmm. they needed that missing ingredient, mm-hmm. and they threw it in there, and it just worked. And yeah, it, it, I feel like it's success for what it is. Yeah, because I kind of went in just going like, oh, cool, you know, we'll give it a watch slash movie. But yeah, I feel like it, it's it's averted more than just mm-hmm. the genre, but, but just more like itself. Like it was, it became bigger than what it was. Yeah. Like it, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, mm-hmm. well, unless you were going to say something there, I just wanted to comment on like, like I think that's the common thread between all of these movies. Uh, and I think that like they all, it's a really fine line between walking of like paying reverence to something while kind of deconstructing and making fun of it, but also not, being like, yeah, but this thing you love is really dumb. Like, the all of mm-hmm. these movies that we've talked about, while they are kind of, like, subverting these things and, in a sense, a little bit making fun of them, but they still, you can tell there still is the love for all of these movies. All of these horror films that we've talked about, they clearly are made by people who have this reverence for horror films. And another example I'll give is, look at Enchanted. That is a movie that is absolutely just taking apart all of the Disney mythos and and deconstructing it. But it also just loves that classic Disney formula while it's totally building up. And like that movie, like in retrospect, that was a hard thing to pull off. So much so that like watch the second one, which does not do a good, in my opinion, and I think a lot of people doesn't really pull that off. But that, and so that first Enchanted was so freaking good. And all these movies that we talk about are so good because they managed to absolutely strike that balance of like we are making fun of this thing and and pointing out all the the tropes to it but still being like but we love it we appreciate it and we know that you watching it also love and appreciate it and we're gonna do this out of the kind of admiration we have for this style of filmmaking Mm -hmm. i think with disenchanted it plays more into the while while enchanted played more into classic disney princesses and disenchanted and for that reason, appealed more to younger fans than than like the classic fans of Disney because it plays more into the tropes of the current or recent Disney princesses, such as like Moana, Mulan, even um, these kind of uh, Rapunzel, these kind of like princesses that are a little bit independent and like are trying to find themselves, have disagreements with like their mo- their parent figure. Because you kind of get that sense with the with the sister with the I mean with the daughter kind of character, but 
Yeah, like I think for that reason, kind of was yeah. was not as well received and wasn't understood, but kind of in. I'm- I think I, they, I, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, I, like, I, I, I really enjoyed I, it. I appreciate what they were trying to do. I just, they just didn't. For me personally, didn't pull it off as well as that original Enchanted, which was, you know, such a masterpiece. Mm. Yeah, and that, and I wanted to touch a little bit on what you were saying, Derek, about there being a fine line when you're trying to parody or satirize the genre, or just in general, because. Sometimes I think I think maybe some studios think it's easy, or are they think there's like a shortcut to do it? Because don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. I, I love the first two, especially the first one. I love the first one because it directly mostly parodies Scream and a Scary Movie, which uh, oh little um, trivia: Scary Movie was supposed to be the original title for Scream. Scream. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah. Anyways, but and the thing is, the those movies, the the first one. I'm gonna focus on the first one. It, it tries to do what Scream did, and it tries to be funny and everything. It's like ninety percent comedy, mm. and it does a fine job of being a funny movie. But there's, it, it it gets it wrong, in that aspect. And then after Scary Movie two, it becomes absolute dog shit. Yeah. Like they're just fucking horrible films. But Th- that that's the, the example they're pulling, they're pulling it. very much so in that way too like they're pulling from not the greatest like scary movies again also like i think like after two like you have the they they like have to like pull from like m night Shyamalan work i think they have like a, a spoof of the happening in one which is like uh Okay, like so immediately date like look at the posters for like any of like three through five and you're just like oh yeah those were movies that came out in like 2008 that we forgot about mm-hmm. yeah. oh man i mean even scary movie one through of them that they, they all <laughs> yeah. are fucking dated yeah. i mean yeah the first one oh god if you were to show the first one to anybody they're gonna be like okay i get they're making fun of scream but everything else you know they have the what's up joke yeah which at the time Two has the matrix sense. Joke. Yeah, yeah. Two has a matrix, and then they have the two has like the the Nike basketball fucking. Oh yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And the fir- what else? Did, the first one. What else did it do? It, it made fun of like more '90s movies too, like uh-huh. uh, Usual Suspects and stuff. I think but, um, the first one, made, which is like a, a classic meme that, but I don't know how relevant it is. But I know that the first one referenced like hide your kids, hide your wife, you know. Oh that, no, that, dude, that was yeah. before it. You no, don't know, no, but one, in one. one. Oh, really? Yeah, the first one? Oh, yeah, that was I guess that. It's his no, character. They... Are you? I don't know. Maybe. Because you know, his... they... Marlon Marlin Wayne's character is very much like that kind of that guy. Mm-hmm. Maybe. I don't oh, know. yeah. But like but like that hide your kids thing was like, that was like, like the meme, like the early memes. Mm-hmm. Like, Scary Movie 1 was like, I think 2000, and it was like, referencing like 90s like commercials and films mm. yeah so like i mean m- maybe it was referencing a later scary movie but anyways mm. um yeah there's that fine line that some films try to do like like again like i said i, I love that movie you know scary movie one's funny as fuck but it fails on trying to do what tucker and dale versus evil did mm. it, it it in the sense where i mean even now like i'm I, if I were to tell somebody, oh, go check out Scary Movie 1, there's a lot of things that they're not going to understand. It's very dated. And mm-hmm. it's not going to hit that same feel as this as this film will, because this film is ultimately kind of timeless. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. It, it, it kind of has all the ingredients of a typical, like, you know, Hells Have Eyes, fucking mm-hmm. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Evil Dead. Of, evil Dead. In the Woods. Yeah, kind exactly. of thing. Uh-huh. Just the classic Words. Cal in a Wood story. Uh-huh. Exactly. So, so like, Scary Movie is, like, it's making fun of Scream, which came out in 96, and it's making fun of beer commercials and maybe The Matrix. I don't know. But it's mm-hmm. very, like, of its time where mm-hmm. sometimes it just, it'll work when it comes out, but it's not going to work forever, unfortunately. Yeah. there There is only one moment in this that, like, puts it in a specific time, but I did actually... Th- think it was really funny because they talk because this you know movie came on 2010 so they talk about 20 years earlier 
which would be like 1990. And then it just mm-hmm. like hard cuts to them playing Pump Up the Jam in that flashback. And I just started like cracking up because it's like this, it's like this serious story. And then it just like starts playing the song from Space Jam. And you're just like, oh my, I can't. Like that, that moment had me. I think stuff like that's okay. I think that's like yeah, it was like it one works, little it thing. Works. Yeah. It, it works, yeah. Because it was a it's reference. Cool. It wasn't a reference to something that was popular when this movie came out. It was a reference to something that had been popular twenty years before this, and so that's why it worked. And the thing is, this will still work because we live in an age of nostalgia mm-hmm. where everything from back then is being re- like, or dude, I fucking nineties feel- still feels like it was like. 10 years ago. 10 years ago. Uh-huh, or 20. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the 90s, 10 mm-hmm. years ago. <laughs> well, that's the whole yeah. point. Like, that's yeah, why exactly, like, I agree. it's very much, uh, yeah, like a phenomenon, recent phenomenon. But, but yeah, no, like the whole thing with the nostalgia is like, I, I've been hearing, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't really listen to the radio as often as I used to, but, you know, times when I'm driving in the car, there's like all these songs that are like using samples of like very popular songs from like the 2000s and the 90s where like it's kind of getting reused to the point where like now people that are way younger than us will hear that and then if they watch this movie like i'm pretty sure pump of the jams is in some film or in some song recently right now i think even my girlfriend played a song the other day where it was like an edm remix of it and it's still gonna connect with people it's still gonna connect in a certain way where people are going to be like, oh, I remember that. And, and even younger viewers are going to laugh at that and be like, oh, yeah, that's pretty funny. Like, e- everyone's going to have a certain stage in their lives when they've heard it kind mm-hmm. of thing. Yeah. yeah so it doesn't absolutely. necessarily date it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But with that, um, thank you guys, as always, for, for having a discussion with me about movies. Yeah. Um, and um, for anyone out there who um like to hear more of us, Derek, guests on some podcasts, any recent ones in- to date? Uh, yeah, I do want to mention that I was recently on a show called Guess What You're Wrong, where we talked about some horror films. We talked about, and I don't even feel bad about saying this, an absolutely terrible horror film called Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, uh, which is really bad. Uh, and then I, I also... I like dog shit. I'm not going to lie. So bad. I, I, it's really bad. Everyone kept asking me at work. They're like, you, you like horror? Are you going to watch it? I was like, that really looks like oh, shit. Oh, it was, it was done vainfully. It was made vainfully, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 yeah I go into that a bit on that podcast, so... That was fun. I'm also um, guest on a couple episodes of Common Ride with me. Just did an episode of the old Super Mario Bros. movie. And then I'm always on my friend Damien's podcast. Um, uh, can I say something? Can I ask you real fast? Uh, yeah, I yeah. mean and ask you, it, just so the listeners get a little bit mm. um, a little bit more detail on it. Common Ride with me. So do you guys talk about Common Rider all the time? So that podcast, he uh, I've basically only been on bonus episodes, but he is watching the Super Sentai show, uh, and yeah. he'll be watching like two different shows, and he, they, him and his co-host kind of go and review episode by episode. Um, I've been on like one episode, I came in blind and just talked about an episode of Jetman, which was the series before they started adapting the Power Rangers. That was a blast, because I had no idea what was going on. Uh, and then, But I've mostly just done bonus episodes that he's done on toku stuff that is more american or different than the uh common writer or um super sentai stuff that he reviews it's a great show everybody should check it out for sure i i, I just asked because i thought you were like secretly a common writer fan <laughs> and i was gonna be like where the fuck did this come from <laughs> but yeah <laughs> continue my bad no no problem and yeah, and then if you would like to hear a lot more of us here at the Undercast Company, you can check out our own podcast of um, more of this, and then as well as my podcast that I release monthly of uh, You've Never Seen. Um, I've recently started a series with my brother. We're following up our previous series of me introducing him to my uh, utmost favorite favorite movies of all time with uh, favorite movies from my childhood because we're we have a 10 year difference and we it's gonna hopefully be pretty fun to the first based on the first episode of um me discussing page, the page master with him of uh she's kind of like introducing like how you know my childhood was and the movies i enjoyed as a, as a as a kid and since i've kind of lived through his own childhood um so so yeah so go and check that out as well and um, with that, I would like to thank all of you, as always, for, for listening to us babble and, and talk about movies. And um, everybody out there, thanks for being amazing. Bye.
All right, see you guys next time. Take it easy, everybody.